Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's third day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2019. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on for Hire Vehicles, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Ruben Diaz, Sr. Uh, we are joined today by Councilmembers Diaz, Councilmember Vallone, Councilmember Powers, Councilmember Matteo, Councilmember Adams, and Councilmember Grudenchik. Today we'll hear from the Taxing and Limousine Commission and the Department of Environmental Protection. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing to together, including the Director, Latanya McKenney, Committee Counsel Rebecca Chasen, Deputy Directors Regina Pareda Ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Head Chima Obacheri and Krillian Francisco, uh, Finance Analyst John Basile and John Seltzer, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, and Roberta uh, Caterano, who pull everything together. Thank you for all your efforts. I'd also like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of budget hearings on May 24th, beginning at approximately 4 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at uh, finance testimony at council.nyc.gov and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with the Taxi and Limousine Commission. TLC's fiscal 2019 executive budget is $52 million, 100% of which is city funds. This represents a 9% decrease in the agency's budget since the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. I'd like to commend the administration for heeding the council's call to have the budget more accurately reflect the likelihood of receiving revenue from the sale of taxi medallions in the current plan. Until the executive plan was released, the budget showed anticipated revenue for fiscal 19 of $107 million, a sum that was not realistic given that the city has no immediate plans to sell any taxi medallions. At today's hearing, I look forward to learning about the TLC's assessment of the e-hail industry and the long-term impact that it may have on the city's tax industry, particularly since TLC is anticipating a decrease in hail licenses for fiscal 2019. I also hope to hear testimony about the future of the Green Grants Program, which provides grants to green cabs which become wheelchair accessible. Before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I'll now turn the mic over to my co-chair, council member Diaz, for his statement, and then we will hear from the TLC commissioner, Mira Joshi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and welcome to the joint hearing of the City Council Finance Committee and for Hire Vehicle Committee on the fiscal year 2019 executive budget. I'm Council Member Ruben Diaz Sr. and I am the chair of the For Hire Vehicle Committee. <clears throat> Before we begin, I would like to thank the chair of the Committee of Finance, my colleague Council Member Daniel Drum who, by the way, Council Member, you have been doing a wonderful job sitting here every day, listening to everybody, all, all the committees, and controlling everything. So congratulations. Uh, you have, you have, have been, been doing a wonderful job. Thank you very much. Today, we will hear testimony from the Taxi and Limousine Commissioner, Ms. Mary Josie, on the, T taxi and T on the TLC expense budget for fiscal year 2019. TLC budget proposed a budget of 52 million for fiscal year 2019. This constitute a 9% decrease from fiscal year 2018, which was 59.5 million, 57.5 million. The decrease is mainly, mainly associated with the lackluster participation in the five borough taxi initiative, which is generally used to help owners offset the cost of retrofitting or making their vehicle wheelchair accessible. The commission also reduced its headcount by 72 full-time positions 
when compared to the to last year adopted budget. In the fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget, TLC include, included anticipated revenue of one $107 million from taxi medallion sale, while the executive budget has since pushed the expected revenue from taxi medallion out beyond the five years financial plan, it still anticipates collecting the revenue sometimes after 2022. The committee hope to hear the committee is hope to hear from the commission on how it anticipates generally this future revenue and what TLC outlook is for yellow medallion values. The committee look forward to, hear, to hearing from the commission on its wheelchair accessibility plan for both medallion taxis and for higher vehicles. Finally, send the TLC issue issue its first for higher vehicle base license to Uber in 2011. App based companies have dramatically increased in popularity. The committees are interested in hearing from TLC outlook and forecast on the future for this thriving industry and its impact in the medallion taxes and the rest of the industry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and back to you. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you for your very kind words. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to ask Council to swear in our panel and then uh, ask um, uh, them to begin. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Uh, good morning, Chair Drum and Chair Diaz and members of the four higher end finance committees. I am Mira Zoshi, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission. Thank you for inviting me to present the TLC's propo proposed executive budget for fiscal year 2019. With me today is Jennifer Tavis, our Deputy Commissioner for Finance and Administration. The TLC's proposed budget is $52 million, which will help the agency continue to regulate New York City's growing for hire industry in ways that protect passengers, drivers, and ensure accessible for hire transportation for all New Yorkers and maintain our enforcement efforts to protect customers and driver income. Today, all TLC licensees are required by TLC regulations to provide equivalent service to passengers in wheelchairs, but we have not yet achieved this goal. The most progress has been made in the yellow medallion sector, where the city's goal is to have a 50% accessible yellow taxi fleet by 2020. Similarly, city's green taxis are under an accessibility mandate. Now more passengers in wheelchairs can hail an accessible taxi because more wheelchair accessible vehicles or waves are circulating, but there's still room for improvements. TLC also operates an accessible dispatch program which provides passengers the opportunity for a safe, reliable ride in an accessible yellow or green taxi, all at the metered fare. Although the Accessible Dispatch Program originally served only Manhattan, it was recently expanded to include trips in all five boroughs, and we'd be happy to provide information and materials about this expanded service to the members. We have also been working with the MTA as it's expanded opportunities for green and yellow taxis to participate in MTA's pilot to use taxis for on-demand service, providing additional income streams for drivers. Taxis are currently doing about 5,000 accessoride trips each weekday and about 2,500 trips on Saturdays and Sundays. And we're excited by the possibilities offered by this participation for passengers, owners, and drivers. We appreciate the interest we've received from council members about deepening our collaboration with the MTA, and we welcome your support. While we've made significant strides for accessibility, we recognize there's more to be done. 
the yellow and green taxi sectors are significantly ahead of the four hire sectors, which have not met the equivalent service mandate for years. The accessibility gap has become greater as the number of for hire vehicles, virtually all of which are not wheelchair accessible, has increased by many tens of thousands. For this reason, the TLC recently passed rules that will require for hire vehicles to dispatch a growing percentage of trips to wheelchair accessible vehicles. The rules will take effect July 1st, and the administration is confident that they will greatly increase the number of wheelchair accessible vehicles in circulation. All New Yorkers should have a safe and reliable transportation within an equitable time frame. I'd also like to up you, update you on the administration's efforts to address inequities in driver income. Although there are more trips in TLC licensed vehicles, the number of licensed drivers has outstripped demand. At the same time, drivers' expenses are significant, as many drivers lease or purchase vehicles so that they can drive for the app and are then burdened with the cost of vehicle payments in addition to all of the other costs involved in operating vehicles, such as insurance and gas. The TLC has been collecting and reviewing data to better understand the driver's expenses and income. The administration's goal is to establish a regulatory framework to protect drivers' income and provide them with the right level of transparency so they know exactly what and how they are being paid and when they are underpaid. Turning now to our budget for fiscal year 2019. Um, it totals $52 million. This amount is comprised of $38 million in personal services and $14 million in other than personal services. This total is about $8.9 million less than the preliminary budget I presented to you in March. The decrease is attributable to TLC's contribution to citywide savings, including a hiring delay, a one-time reduction of 72 vacancies pending our joint efforts with the Department of Citywide Services to more effectively recruit new safety and admission and enforcement inspectors. Additionally, this revised total budget represents a $7 million increase in funding for our green grant program to reflect demand for these grants. Finally, our projected revenue budget for fiscal year 2019 is $57.3 million. As we noted in our preliminary budget, the city has reviewed the continued presence of future medallion auctions in the budget. This executive budget addresses the matter by removing the medallion revenue from our fiscal 2019 budget and delaying medallion sales beyond the five-year financial plan. This change allows the city to continue to monitor the medallion market and does not foreclose any medallion auctions at a future date. We expect that licensing will continue to be our largest source of revenue. Beginning in January 2016, we began licensing drivers for up to three-year term instead of a two-year term, and these three-year licenses will come up on their first renewal during fiscal year 2019. Therefore, revenue from driver's license renewals will be down for the first half of fiscal year 2019. We'll monitor revenue during the year and work with OMB on any adjustments to that projection. In conclusion, this has been a time of increased attention on the for hire industry, particularly on financial challenges faced by drivers in the taxi and for hire sectors. We appreciate the Council's longstanding interest in examining policies to support drivers. We look forward to working with you on this and other topics as we continue our work to make sure that over our over one million passengers a day enjoy safe and reliable transportation and to improve conditions for our 180,000 licensed drivers. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify and I am now able to answer your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, let me just start with taxi medallion sales. In fiscal 19, uh, the anticipated revenue of $107 million um, for the sale, uh, they, we were anticipating $107 million in the sale of medallions. Uh, I know that uh, you mentioned that it's going to be pushed further out or beyond in the five-year financial plan, but it doesn't actually say um, what the expected revenue to be raised further on would be, just delaying the timing. Um, so what are the latest plans for the future of the medallion sales? Um, I think it's significant. Um, there have been prior modifications to the medallion sales, which sort of 
pushed one year, two years. Um, the significance of pushing it beyond the five years is to really create the space um, for us to have a better understanding of where the medallion market will be in several years. Uh, and that's important given the amount of change that's gone on. Even this year, prices have come down and medallion transactions has gone, have gone up in number. We're at a higher volume this year um, at this point than we were last year at this point. So there's a lot of fluidity and change. Um, and it's important, I think, for the city to have a better sense of that before um, putting the medallions into the concrete budget that we focus on in the next five years. So if you say that the medallion sales have um, gone up, but the price has gone down. The volume of sales, right, transactions. But, so are you carrying the $107 million forward? Because then you're not going to hit that if the price has gone down. The 107 million, as well as the other years where revenue had previously been allotted, are, have all been pushed out beyond the five years, and so are obviously going to be subject to additional modification as OMB reviews circumstances. But yes, the the price the prices have come down considerably, um, and it's hard to say what what exactly if we were to have a medallion sale this year, the right number to put in the budget would be. So what type of um, changes in the taxi market have to happen uh, to allow the city to sell additional medallions? One of the biggest obstacles today in, in any medallion transaction is lack of a, a lending community. This is a market that depended heavily on leveraging. Um, there would be very small down payments and very large loans. And there was many lending institutions that were comfortable with that and gave out large, um, large loans. Um, some of those institutions have been taken over by regulators for unsound banking practices, and others um, have on their own decided not to continue to lend in this market. Without an, an ability to borrow money, there's always going to be a depression in price. So the transactions we see now are primarily cash transactions of drivers. Um, but the primary, uh, the primary mover here is not the dollar amount, it's really the trip volume and where the passengers are. And uh, there's been a switch in where passengers patronize. They patronize a lot of the app services, and many of those are people that used to patronize taxi service. Um, so the, I think the, the key thing is um, monitoring trip volumes, um, uh, an in, a renewed interest in the lending market, as well as um, the taxi business uh, taking opportunities that it has to um, a, sort of build the business strategy that's akin to what they see customers enjoying now. So, for instance, we just passed a pilot that will allow the taxi apps to give um, one of the benefits that, say, Uber and Lyft customers have, they order an Uber or Lyft car and they can see what the price is up front. They make a decision based on that price. So now the um, apps that work in taxis and any other apps that want to come into that uh, field can also provide that same customer service for passengers. Um, and because that's what people are relying on now to make decisions, we hope that this is an opportunity. We've also done a lot in terms of uh, uh, updating regulations to give uh, yellow medallion owners more freedom in what vehicles they buy, not requiring them to have the partition, allowing them um, to run their vehicles for longer, and uh, lowering the transfer tax, which was something that this council did, um, which was very much appreciative and, and does, does feed into the current volume of of transactions we're seeing today. So we'll continue to work with the industry and find ways that we can um, make operating that business easier for them and continue to give them opportunity so that they can pro provide customers with some of the amenities that the apps are providing them that customers appear to like very much. So what would be your assessment of the e-hail industry now and um, what it would look like in the future? Um, it is certainly growing. We bring on 3,000 new drivers and 2,000 new cars every month, and most of those cars and drivers are going to work for app companies. Um, it is the the you know the sort of broad assessment, um, especially that what I've read from people that have studied this is that there is going to be uh, more 
pool of passengers that are taking public transportation as shared rides become more common and as the price point keeps going down. So I think you'll see uh, a continued grow, growth of that passenger base, but also into, an, into areas that haven't, we haven't traditionally thought of as taxi customers, um, because when the price point gets closer and closer to what it costs to take a subway, many people are going to opt to take a shared ride in a private vehicle instead. I have to tell you, the first and only time I've ever taken an e-hail ride, I opened the door to the car and there was somebody else sitting in there. It was very shocking <laughs> to see yes. someone like, what are you doing here? Well, New York City, I think, is slow to pick on, I mean, to, to catch on to shared rides. It's something that can be done in the taxi industry as well as the inhale industry. But we are seeing from our data um, that it is actually picking up. Um, and there are more people in New York City that are sharing sharing rides. Um, and it's another place where we'd like to make sure the taxi has the opportunity to take advantage of that market as well. So overall, how do you see the yellow um, cab industry faring? The yellow cab industry, to the extent it, it, it's a hail industry, which it is primarily and has been for decades, um, has a, a very a, a real solid core in Manhattan. Because of the density, it is often easier to get a yellow cab than it is to order something on your phone. Um, I do sometimes see people ordering on their phone as they watch yellow cabs go by, and I wonder. But it really is easier. Um, and then there's going to be uh, the, the, what we'll have to see is how the yellow cab industry is also able to take care, take advantage of other opportunities like partnerships with the MTA and other partnerships that provide additional streams of income as well as additional service outside of Manhattan, probably through the apps because that is the easier way to get service outside of Manhattan. So um, I see Manhattan remaining the core business of the yellow medallion industry, but I do see the yellow medallion industry branching out to take advantage of some of the other income streams. Okay, good. Let's talk a little bit about the wheelchair accessibility that you mentioned in uh, your testimony. Uh, to date, how much funding assistance has the commission provided? In terms of grants? Um, yeah, there's a 20% of street hail licenses or wheelchair accessible. Sure. So let me give you the broad outline of the program. I'm going to defer to my deputy commissioner for the exact figures. There's yellow uh, cab grants that we give out, which add up to about $30,000. They're given $15,000 when they hack up the car to defray the cost of purchase, and then um, about $4,000 every year to cover the maintenance. We launched last year the same program for the green taxis. They're given $30,000, 15 when they hack up the car, and then $4,000 every for four years to cover maintenance and other costs. In total, um, I'm going to defer to my deputy commissioner to give you the totals of how much has been given out in each category to date. Uh, so uh, originally, you just turn on that mic, and if you could just identify yourself also. I'm Jennifer Tavis, it. Deputy Commissioner of Finance and Administration of the Taxi and Limousine Commission. Uh, we were initially awarded $54 million uh, to make grants to support these efforts. Uh, 1,266 grants have been awarded since 2013. $18.7 million are represented by those grants. Uh, we have, as you saw in the budget, received uh, cuts of $7 million in this current fiscal year and $7 million in fiscal year 19. And uh, the, we anticipate that we will still have sufficient funds to cover the grants uh, and the level of interest that we are seeing. So you, you call that a cut, it's quote unquote a savings mm -hmm. in terms of the $7 million because of a lack of interest in the program, am I right? Yes, that's accurate. OMB is looking at what we are actually spending compared to what we were allocated during the fiscal year. They have seen the demand for these grants reduce, and they have removed funding accordingly. So what do you anticipate will happen moving forward to 20 to 22? Oh, I think one important uh, change in the coming years versus last year is 
We passed at the end of December a package that requires the for hire industry to provide wheelchair accessible service, yeah, okay. and they can use green taxis to provide that service. So for those bases that um, are going to fulfill their mandate um, and are looking for ways to do that, uh, that, per, that comes with some built-in funding, the green taxis are the best option. And in, although our funding was cut, we still have about 2.4 million, I believe. Is that right, 2.9 million? Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's about, yeah, let me look it up. Um, to cover green grant requests. And obviously, if it looks like we have more requests than we have funding, we'll go back to work with OMB to make sure we have the money. Um, but we are very hopeful that people that need to meet this new mandate will take advantage of the opportunity because for the individual drivers and owners, it's a great small business model. Uh, they can get dispatches from the base. They can provide service for wheelchair passengers, but they also can pick up hails on the street, which lets them independently run their, you know, have a little more control over their income. Okay, thank you. I just want to uh, say that we've been joined by Councilmember Constantinides. Councilmember Cornegie, Councilmember Moya, and we have questions from, uh, excuse me, we're gonna go to Chair, Chair Diaz, and then we do have questions after that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, how are you doing today? Very good, how are you? I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna, I want to talk about legacy. You know, legacies, uh, when you came to be the commissioner, the taxi, the yellow industry, the medallion, I believe, was worth $1.5 million. Now it's all $200,000. The industry is going down. People are killing themselves. Is that the legacy you want to leave when you leave? Well, you're in this with me too now. Huh? You're in this with me too now. No, I just can't get it like that. My legacy, I'm planning to live, to, 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 to live a legacy. I think your legacy is what all these people wearing yellow hats are waiting yes. for. My question to you is, it was $1.5 million. Now it's $200,000. People are killing themselves. When I was interviewed the, uh, by question, this council uh, at my hearing before I was appointed, I talked about things that I thought were important to accomplish. One of them was accessibility. The other one was working in, on the illegal commuter van industry. Another one was making sure that the agency had enough data. And another one was vision zero. And another one was driver income. And I think we've done incredible work in all of those. And I can go through each one of them if you'd like me to. Accessibility, I think I gave a very good summary in my testimony. On commuter vans, just yesterday was introduced yet another bill that will help us on commuter van enforcement. We have also started in a, a forfeiture program last year, and as a result, have seized and forfeited over 40 illegal commuter vans and worked very closely with the commuter van industry about, to make sure that we about, get there. What about the yellow families, the people that have- Let me finish, you asked about my legacy, so yeah, I'm going yellow, through it. I'm the yellow. And, and we talked about driver income, which is something we're working okay. on, and Vision Zero, which is we've done incredible work on enforcement and limiting driver hours. I, uh, what I've said from the beginning, and I said at my hearing, and I've said every year since then, is the city has a vested interest in making sure there's publicly available, accessible service. And that is promoting that industry that provides it, which is the yellow taxi industry. And so we've taken incredible steps to help promote that that service continue. We don't peg a value to the medallion, what medallions are bought and sold at. We look at the service. We wanna make sure the service is available. Um, independently, banks and buyers and sellers are free to look at data to make their own decisions about what the price is. And the price did go up very high, not all due to s pure market um, forces. There were several individuals who self-admittedly 
bought and sold and bought and sold to increase the value of the medallion so they could therefore increase the amount of a loan they could take out afterwards. So that's a certain amount of inflation that has no relation to the value of the asset underlying it. Today we see almost a negative correction. There's no lending around. So all of the transactions are going to be, are going to be without financing and all cash, which is certainly going to depress the value of it. So the value of the medallion is something that definitely the financial world is in a key to. What that translates to the city is, is there service out there? Are people able to get service? Are people who use wheelchairs able to hail accessible taxis? And that's happening today a lot more than it was happening four years ago. I just want to be sure that when you leave, you leave, you leave, you leave behind a good legacy. I sleep well at night. Thank you. Uh, I don't. Uh, believe me, I don't. When I see people killing themselves, I cannot sleep well. I got, I can't even sleep. But thank you. Uh, praise God that you are sleeping well while people are killing themselves. No more questions. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we're now going to move to questions from members. Uh, Councilmember Adams, followed by Councilmember Constantinidis, and then Moya. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, I just have a couple of questions for you uh, regarding illegal street hails. Uh, how many of the Commission's staff are currently dedicated to combating illegal street hails? We have an enforcement staff that's in the field every day. We have definitely vacancies there, but it comprised about, about 150 officers. Um, they are split among all five boroughs 24-7, so as you can see, it's not a hell of a lot of coverage, but they try to be as strategic as possible to make sure that they are providing equivalent enforcement throughout the city and also responsive to complaints about particular hotspots. Do you see um, or do you anticipate hiring additional enforcement agents? We do. We have um, vacancies that we can fill even with the 72 heads that we've lost and we're actively working with DCAS to make sure that those vacancies are filled. Okay. Um, I'm just going to relate a little bit to you about my area specifically. I know that um, my colleague, Councilmember Miller, has also expressed our concern in Southeast Queens um, for the enormous saturation of cars, specifically dollar vans, illegal uh, vans, illegal cars, uh, black cars, um, that pretty much have taken over our corridors, uh, specifically uh, the Jamaica Corps, downtown Jamaica Corps. Um, I'm just curious to know how how enforcement has been beefed up in the area. Um, I'm a daily commuter, and for me, it's still very, very intense. Um, I need to know and understand the regulation behind these black cars uh, with out-of-state license plates that pretty much run the roads, uh, and uh, pedestrian safety is an extreme issue in downtown Jamaica. Uh, those of us that drive and walk uh, it's it's very very dangerous situation. So I would really really appreciate your feedback on that situation. Sure, and especially with the out of states, we've seen a lot more Texas and PA state uh, license plates. New Jersey is also extremely. Um, we we do what we can with our resources, and we also partner with um, MTA, Port Authority, NYPD, and now the sheriff's office to try to use their law enforcement resources in combination with ours. In Southeast Queens in particular, we've done um, a few of what we call surge operations where we'll deploy almost all of our staff to those problem areas to really set a tone. Unfortunately, people come back and we will continue to do those surge operations, but they need to know that we're aware of it and we're working actively on it. We've uh, done the forfeiture program, which Set, we've seized many dozens of commuter vans. Those, instead of paying a bond and getting that van back, which is what used to happen, there's no bond. We retain that van and then we sell it at a civil auction um, months later. Uh, in addition, we have seen a 
proliferation of larger 20 seat plus buses that are operating illegally, which we don't have the jurisdiction to stop, but through Jumani, uh, Council Member Jumani Williams and I believe Danique Miller um, and a few other council members, have, bill was introduced yesterday that will give us that jurisdiction um, and we're anxious to be able to do that enforcement work because it's extremely frustrating for our officers to see those very dangerous vehicles holding lots of passengers go by without any consequences. I, I agree with you with that. Um, but we would percent. also um, like to, I can put you in touch with our deputy commissioner because if you have particular areas in your community that you need attention, um, we would like to be responsive to that and, and send our officers there. I appreciate that very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you would allow me just one quick follow-up. How often are those surge um, operations performed? downtown Jamaica specifically? I, I wish there was a regular schedule, but given our resources, there isn't. Um, we did several a few months ago, um, but I'll certainly make sure that you have contact with our deputy commissioner who plans them um, so that you have, a, you have an idea of how frequently we're there. Okay, thank you very much. I will okay. come back for the next round in behalf of our colleague, uh, Barry Grudenchik. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Constantinides. Thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Diaz. Commissioner, it's good to see you again. Um, you know my deep concern about leveling the playing field and making sure that as we see Uber add over, was it 80,000 cars now to the city streets? There, we license over 130,000 cars today. So, yeah, so we're talking about numbers when you come to congestion, to traffic, public safety, these are deeply concerning numbers to me. Uh, and I know we share that goal and I look forward to working with the chair to get something done. And I wanna echo my colleague, Adrian Adams, uh, when she talks about enforcement. I see you have a hiring delay in place here. Is that also for enforcement agents? The hiring delay is um, that we were delayed in hiring. And yes, it is enforcement agents. A lot of it has to do with um, we, we call from a civil list, um, and when the list is expired, we have to work with DCAS to find alternate ways. Um, there's other, other issues regarding enforcement that have to do with compensation that make it difficult for us to recruit and retain officers. Um, they begin at a starting salary of about 38000 and they end up at a salary that's closer to 47,000 with all of the like add-ons, but that's a much lower ending point than, for example, NYPD, DOC, sanitation, um, and they have a difficult job. They're doing car stops all day, which is some of the most dangerous law enforcement work there is. Um, and so we, we do lose a lot of officers when they hit that two, three, four year mark because they go over to other agencies. Uh, so but it sounds like you need more money to increase salaries to make sure we, we can can't, retain staff well, and we make sure we have increase enforcement. increase salaries so. without a <laughs> contract negotiation that allows for that, but that's ongoing now between OLR and the unions, and we're hopeful that there will be a room there for our officers to get a higher, get a higher cap-out salary um, so they can be more, you know, more um, aptly compensated for the level of work that they're doing. I mean, we definitely need, you know, for when it comes to illegal street hails, we need more enforcement. We need more agents on the street. We need to make sure that we're doing all of those things. Very quickly, because I'm running out of time, um, I don't see anything in here for the Taxi Smart Card. I know that's something we've talked about in the past. Is that program coming back? I know the seniors in my district are very interested. So will the smart card itself, that mechanism, um, they ran into a problem with the banks and they can't issue those cards anymore as, as credits against taxi um, fares. But the, uh, the city's uh, Department of Aging has received a grant to provide some funds for transportation for seniors and we're working with them on how they want to spend that and encouraging them to, uh, to allow seniors to use taxis. But we can fill you in on that too. If I can have one more question, Chair, thank you. Um, as Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, I'm glad that we're spending uh, less money um, by introducing electric vehicles. I'm very excited about that. I am a little concerned, though, that we are spending more money on heat, light, and <laughs> power. Um, yeah, uh, we're not always how, the landlord. Uh, you're not the landlord. No, not always. I mean, some one of our facilities were the one of our facilities were the rental. 
uh, is a rental, actually two. Um, the only facility where we are, the landlord, is our Woodside facility. And are we looking at opportunities for 80 by 50 implementation uh, you know, for sustainability? We are certainly for our Woodside facility because their construction needs to be happen happening there. Um, the half of the building needs to come, be, come down and be rebuilt, and it is part of the zero emissions plan for uh, what, it, what that final building will be. So solar power, geothermal, something All of that. is consideration yes. there. It's a, it's a very ambitious um, but achievable plan. Great, because I, I mean, I, when I see us spending $33,000 more on heat, light, and power, that concerns me. Yes. We're definitely trying to get to a, a, an 80 by 50 goal. All right, thank you, Commissioner. You're welcome. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Francisco Moya. Thank, thank you, Chairman, and, and thank you, Commissioner, um, for your time. I just have one quick question, and I brought this up at the last um, hearing. It's a big concern of mine as I'm seeing that we're approaching this, this bubble here. But do we have a mechanism to regulate uh, the leases uh, for the e-hails uh, like we do for the yellow cabs? Um, I just feel that there is a bubble approaching with these subprime leases, this bait and switch that's going on right now, and I feel that a lot of uh, these drivers that have gotten themselves in this are not going to be able to afford uh, to pay for these vehicles or when their leases are up, uh, get into another vehicle as well. And I just wanted to know if there was any mechanisms in place, are you thinking about this uh, at all? Um, it is a problem, and I've seen some pretty horrendous leases where people end up at the end of the lease paying $80,000 for a $25,000 car. And worse than that, that money is deducted from their pay. So if they want to skip a payment and pay something else, like a hospital bill or whatever, they don't have that choice because it's automatically deducted from ha when they're paid by the company for the services. Um, so there's a couple different fronts we've been looking at that. Um, we have definitely referred um, you know, really egregious examples that have come to us to consumer protection agencies that handle consumer protection enforcement. Um, and we, on our own, um, will wor are working on a set of transparency rules, much like we do in the taxi world, where the driver is told up front what the costs are, what they would look at the end of the lease period, because it's important to understand what, what the bottom line is at the end of three years. Um, and in the taxi world, we've gone further, where we've capped the amount that the driver can be charged. Um, there we have the advantage of being able to license the person who is charging them, the agent. We don't have that same authority over the car dealerships, um, so we have to really try to see how well we can make our transparency rules do a lot of that work. Um, but we, if you have examples um, and you have particular instances, we would love to hear about them because the more we get those examples, the more they inform the kind of transparency rules that need to be in place so drivers know how much it costs to get involved. We also did produce, and I don't have them with me today, but I can share them with you, Please. two flyers that say, because of a concern that drivers don't know how much it costs to get into the business, a flyer that says how much, you know, you want to drive a yellow taxi, this is what it costs, you want to drive an FHV, this is what it's going to cost, putting it all on one page so they can see up front that there's going to be commercial insurance, a car lease, fingerprinting, DMV checks, criminal background checks, our applications. And, you know, and a lot of times people don't think about that. They get an incentive Correct. offer, they take the incentive and they forget or they don't realize that there's a tremendous amount of other expenses that are involved in being in this business. Correct. Uh, I won't take up too much of uh, your time, but I, I just would like to follow up with you on a couple of these things that you mm -hmm. mentioned right now. And thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Cornegie. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, as the Chair of the New York City Task Force on uh, MWBEs, um, I just had a question as it relates to MWBEs. Uh, uh, if you could provide me and the committee with the MWBE percentages for TLC contracts for fiscal year 2017 and the projections for 2018 uh, and 2019. Yes, I'm gonna defer to my Deputy Commissioner of Finance Administration who will provide you with that information. Give us one moment. Just give us sure, thank you. Well, actually, I'm not in charge of the clock, so. 
I'll, I'll don't, yeah, please don't, don't charge it for this moment. Don't let it count against my time, please, <laughs> yeah. uh, Chair. Right. Do you have it? Yeah. Oops, it's dangerous. Thank you. Uh, so our MWBE utilization rate for FY17 was 24% of total procurements. And, and if you had the projections for 18 and 19, that would be great. Uh, I do not currently have the projections for 18 and 19, but we're happy to follow up. What is, what is the dollar amount associated with that, for, with 2017's allocation? That was 696,000 uh, in MWBE procurements out of a total of 2,862,000. Uh, so I, I will be um, requesting that I follow up from my committee's perspective okay. uh, with you on your, M, you know, the city has a very ambitious MWBE goal and we want to make sure that we can be helpful uh, in, in arriving at that goal. So I'd like to follow up with you for the projections for 18 and 19 as well. Okay, okay. actually I just, uh, the projection for FY 2018 is 34.6%, uh, which is above the 30% uh, goal in Local Law 1. So that's act our, our actual, I think our projection under Local Law was, our goal was to hit 30% and we're at 34.6% now. So we're above where we were last year, obviously more to go, but we're headed in the right direction. Definitely, but I'd just like to follow up on a breakdown of what, what those contracts actually look sure. like. Absolutely. And where my committee can be helpful in uh, if you're having any areas uh, that could be bolstered in terms of that, I'd love to be able to be helpful. Yes, I mean, a lot of our procurements are smaller than other agencies, but it's no, no you know, it's still a, a procurement with the city agency. It's worth something, and we really would appreciate the help to make sure we're recruiting and getting that information out to the right audiences. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you, uh, you know, thank you for your leadership, and thank you, you know, to the chairman of the committee now. We know that this is not a black and white, a agency this is very tough because as we would like to enforce against illegal street hill in a particular area there's always another group who will be negative impact if we increase penalty for illegal street hill uh, because of the green would like to see increase of penalty in the washington heights or the bronze then we have the liberty to say you've been too tough with us if we do the same thing in the Midtown area, then it's important for the yellow, but then the Uber and the other, they will say, nah, you know, we should have more flexibility. So we know that it's a situation that is not so easy to resolve, and I know that it requires leadership. When the penalty will increase for the legal street hill, going up to 10,000, only for the legal uh, uh, street hill in the Midtown area, and the JFKs. How can you describe the numbers of tickets that are being going, giving, going so far at $10,000 for legal street hill in the Midtown area and JFK in LaGuardia? I, I can get you those exact numbers. What I can tell you today, as a follow up, I can get you the exact numbers because the $10,000 doesn't apply to every illegal street hail, it applies only to those that are done in a TLC licensed vehicle, so it's a subset of our illegal street hail numbers. Um, but overall, in the um, central business district, uh, that's about 70% of our enforcement um, as opposed to the rest of Manhattan where that's about 30%. So there are definitely more, you know, enforcement is done in the Midtown area and in the CBD area, but I'm happy to follow up with you on the exact number of tickets that are issued pursuant to that section which carries a penalty of $10,000. Um, and often if people choose not to go to a hearing, um, they will pay a much smaller amount in a settlement. It's still a substantial amount. It is not $10,000, though. Yeah. What will that take to give a, a, a brief of grace or amnesty for drivers who owe thousands of dollars in fine 
It, as you know, I, this is something that I've been bringing to your attention, not just now that I don't chair this committee, but I've been also having this discussion with you before when I used to chair also the Liberal Committee. Like, what does it take for us to work with you, TLC, identify numbers of drivers that they owe thousands of dollars that probably if we give a amnesty for them not to pay that money if the tickets are not related to public safety? It's hard to answer that question without knowing what that universe is because most of our tickets and certainly most of our tickets that carry heavy fines are for public safety, illegal or illegal activity. Um, so there are not ones that we would be prepared to give amnesty on. For many of the smaller violations like equipment, non-safety equipment violations, we've is started issuing warnings. Um, we've also started to issue notice of violations, so it's not a summons unless you fail to get it fixed. So it'd be, it would take some understanding of what that category is. We have payment plans um, for people that have outstanding um, monies that's owed to us, and we have recently made them more generous. But for people that have um, thousands of dollars, and, and we can definitely assess to understand what that universe is, um, we would need to understand how many of them are actually for non-safety violations. Because if that group is really not non-safety violations, then an amnesty for that group wouldn't really have much effect to, to the people that are currently owing us money. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have questions from Councilmember Gordenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I have a lot of taxi drivers that live in my community. I, I know many people do. And one of the things I think is most promising, and you touched on it in your testimony, is um, allowing yellow cabs and green cabs to pick up excess ride, and I just hope you could just expand on that a little and tell us how that's going. Sure. So, um, as I said in the beginning, um, and in response to sort of where is the industry going, I think it's very important that we make sure there's opportunities for the yellow taxi industry to get streams of income beyond the traditional hail market, as that hail market isn't as broad as it used to be a few years ago. And one of those opportunities is working with the MTA. So the, we, after years of working with the MTA, we finally got to a point where they agreed to send accessoride trips to green and yellow taxis. Um, that does a tremendous amount for the passenger. They're in a mainstream vehicle instead of a white bus. Um, and they've gone one step further and introduced on-demand service. So the passenger no longer has to wait three hours for the trip and book 24 hours in advance. And, and that's going um, very well. We had a meeting with several uh, members of the disabled community and, and one of them called Accessoride and said, I have to hurry up downstairs, they're gonna come in five minutes. And we were all pretty shocked, but this was the new on-demand taxi service. Um, for those trips that are done in an accessible yellow or green taxi, the MTA and the vendor have agreed to give the driver, I believe it's a $10 bonus, so that it's an extra incentive to take out an accessible taxi. And um, I, there's, this is uh, rapidly growing, because when I looked at the numbers now are 5,000 uh, trips a day on a weekday and 2,500 on weekends. A few months ago, that was 3,000 trips a day. So. I think that the MTA and the, and, the, and the taxi industry are seeing a lot of opportunity here. Customer satisfaction, because there's also, um, the, since it's a pilot, they're looking at to see what customer satisfaction fulfillment rates are, and they are very high, so that's also a, a good plus for Accessoride. There's a cost savings. Um, I think an Accessoride trip costs in the neighborhoods of upwards of 70 some dollars. Um, and a taxi trip, when you include in the administrative work that you need with the dispatcher, costs about $35. So that's a savings to the city and it's, to the state. It's a, it's a rare win-win-win for everybody. It's yes. a win for the consumer, it's a win for the taxi driver, and it's a win for the taxpayer because we're saving money. And I hope that we'll be able to expand this program 
um, and use, uh, you know, 5,000 is a lot of trips. New York, 5,000 isn't much of anything, it's, but yes. it's Yes, there's lot. a lot of room for growth, and this is an industry that certainly needs these opportunities for income enhancement. So we're, we're hopeful that the MTA will continue and grow. Thank you, and if program. there's anything I could do to help that, please, I'm not on. Keep saying your, uh, your voice, your public support for it. That I would will. always you hear me? Do you hear me here, Councilman? I'm, so, I'm looking at Chair Diaz. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Very good. I just have some uh, follow-up questions now on the Yellow Taxi Cab app. Um, do you have any details on how many riders currently use the app to hail yellow cabs? Uh, there are two apps right now. One's called Curb and one's called Arrow. Um, and I will follow up with you on what the daily ridership is. It is not tremendous. What most passengers are finding more convenient about the app is that they can pay for their their trip once they get in the cab. So once they get in the cab, they put in a code and they're done. Their tip is default set and they don't have to worry about pulling out a credit card at the end of the trip or paying in cash. So the higher volume of usage comes in the payment. Um, what we'll have to see is now that we've given them the ability to give upfront pricing and a little more price security, that whether those um, hail rates go up in the yellow taxi app world. Um, and I want to mention the app is also the way that the MTA is using them. So the app is the vehicle that connects the taxi to the accessoride passenger. How much did it cost to develop that app? I don't know because they're done by private industries. We set the specifications. Um, there are certain consumer protections that we want to make sure are there. There are certain privacy and security measures, but then it's an open market. Anyone can come in. So far we've had two. We've got some interest from other companies, um, and I think the more the merrier. So the, the app is different in every circumstance to hail a yellow cab? I mean to to do it, to use an app to get a cab? The, there, there are two companies that are operating. One is called Curb and one is called Arrow. If you download either of those apps, you can hail a yellow or a green taxi cab. And then once you've hailed it, your credit card is on file with the app, just like Ubers or Lyfts. And so once you get in the car, it's already synced up and your card's going to be charged, and then you leave after your trip. You don't have to exchange anything. Um, but you have a second feature with these apps. You can also just pay in a car that you've actually hailed yourself. Did you ever hear of Taxi to Go? Taxi to Go? To go. Um, I am not familiar with that, but I'm, I'm not, that doesn't mean that my policy staff hasn't been working with them. Um, but we'll, I'll certainly check for you. OK, and um, do all yellow cab drivers have access to both um, apps? Yes, they can work with either one. And, and the apps have access to the entire fleet of yellow cabs and green cabs. OK, so um, let me just go to carpooling. Um, can you describe that program for me uh, and how that works? In yellow or in? Yellow. OK, yellow. in yellow, um, it's always been allowed if both passengers if agree to it, or the, really it's the first passenger. Um, but with the apps, you can do a lot of that online, which is how programs like Via or Uberpool or Liftline work. So for example, Curb, one of the apps, is working with Via um, so that if you request through the app, they say, OK, you'll get a discount if we match you with somebody else. Um, it's still in its very early stages. Uh, the car sharing is, is difficult to get off the ground in New York, but it is getting much more um, acceptable. Uh, so I'm hoping that, again, the recent pilot that we allowed for more freedom with the apps will also allow them to do car sharing um, in ways they haven't been able to. One of the aspects of car sharing that we've seen from the data is it's going on in the boroughs a, li a little bit, uh, other than like VIA, which only operates on that model, but those that don't, that operate in both worlds, their car sharing, actual shared rides happen more in the boroughs than they do in central Manhattan. So it may be that the greens who are in the boroughs can get more of that, or if there's yellows that are in the boroughs, um, which is not as common, that they would be able to do more of the car sharing work. Um, I do think it's gaining in popularity, and it would be smart for any of the app developers that are in this space um, to figure out how they can take advantage of that. Do you know the numbers for the yellow taxis? 
Do I know how many he... are participating in the program? In the in the yellow for the yellow cabs in the partnership to pick up um, any passengers. any yellow cab that is using, I believe it is curb. That is the any any yellow cab. So it's really up to the driver. So any driver that is using curb to pick up trips will also pick up these shared trips as well. They're just not a lot in number because they're functioning in Manhattan and it's really not the prime territory. Most people don't want to share a cab in Manhattan. They want to get where they want to get quickly. No, but do you know that? Do you, would you know those numbers? Do they share those numbers with you? Um, I can check. I believe they do. So I can get them for you, certainly. That would be interesting yeah. to see as yeah, well. Yeah, because we require people to tell us every time there's an actual shared ride. So presumably we'll have those numbers as well. Okay. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about licensing uh, facility wait times. Mm -hmm. uh, the average wait time at the Long Island City licensing facility decreased 48% to 12 minutes during the four, first four months of fiscal 2018 when compared to the same period in fiscal 2017. How was TLC able to reduce the wait time by 48 percent? Um, you're talking about people when they get their actual physical license, mm -hmm. right? Um, a tremendous amount of work has been done to bring the process online. Drivers are mobile. They do a lot of things on their phones. We wanted to make sure that they were able to upload documents, check on the status of their application, um, and, and um, submit other pieces of information that are necessary to complete an application from their phone. And over the last year, we've gotten all of that integrated into our licensing system, and it's been incredible. Not only are the wait times down, but it's more customer satisfaction. It is a lot easier for people to upload their DMV abstract than to make a trip to wait in line to come and give it to us at our licensing facility. We also have opened up just as an aside, but it also has to do with customer service, a DMV facility within our licensing, so that the medallion taxi owners who used to have to go to two or three spots in order to get their plates can just come to Fauci and we'll issue the plates for them right there and then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually heard of that. Okay. So let me also talk a little bit about inspection times. I think in, um, in 2017, you had, it was, the average time was 48 minutes, and then in uh, 2017, it went up to 58 minutes. Can you explain why um, it's taking longer? A lot more cars. It really is due to the fact that we have a lot more cars. Um, we have a certain number of lanes, and we also have um, the same number of staff. So we haven't had a real increase in the number of, of inspectors that are available to do this work. Okay, okay that's it for me. Uh, Chair, Chair Diaz? Mr. Chairman, as I said this morning, today I came in peace. So I don't want to ask no more questions. I just want to congratulate and express my appreciation to this to central staff, the staff of the uh, the committee, and my counsel, Christopher Lin, and all of the members that have been working with me. I'm happy, Mr. Committee, Mr. Chairman, because Yesterday, in the Village Voice, it came an article where the, our speaker, the Honorable Carly Johnson, has expressed yeah, it's his support to uh, regulate, regulate Uber. And he has shown that this, com that this city council and the committee on for hire vehicle has is his support and the support of the of the members and I'm, I'm i'm happy i'm happy to hear that our speaker go publicly uh talking about the ills that have been done uh to, to yellow and to the industry and the, his willingness to correct those ill illness. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. and I'm happy. Okay, thank you very much. And I want to thank the panel for coming in. Uh, we're not going to adjourn this meeting uh, because we're going to continue a little bit later on with the second hearing with the EPA. But for now, I just want to say thank you for coming in and uh, 
we look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you, and we'll follow up with the items that the several council members have asked us to follow up with, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much.